This is Sayre Road Cemetery number one. It's one of, of around 3,000 British Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries here in uh, the Western Front. Not all World War I, some are World War II. But, uh, you know, in my week in France, on the Western Front, I have literally walked or driven past the graves of hundreds of thousands of men from and women from all over the world. Not just Britain and France and Germany, but you know, I'm standing right here and I'm looking at graves from Australia and New Zealand. There are those from India who fought here and from Africa, from various nations. And um, it, it can get a little overwhelming and it can be difficult to take in. And so what I try to do is remind myself that every grave I see represents a story represents a life and to remember too that hundreds of thousands aren't even in marked graves they're still out on the battlefield somewhere but in order to remind us of the real cost of this war I have tried to take the time to tell some stories of some of the men uh, and women who died in the Great War in the various cemeteries, and I want to do that here today at the Somme. Uh, because the British Commonwealth war graves tend to be in much smaller cemeteries, uh, we're going to walk around uh, several cemeteries today and just share some stories. Come with me as I do that. Horace Isles was 14 years old when he joined up with the Leeds Pals, the West Yorkshire Regiment. His sister wrote a letter to him on July 9th, 1916, anxious for news, and this is what she wrote. We did hear that they were fetching all back from France under 19. For goodness sake, Horace, tell them how old you are. I'm sure they'll send you back if they know you're only now just 16. You have seen quite enough. Now just chuck it up and try to get back. You won't fare no worse for it. If you don't do it now, you will come back in bits, and we want the whole of you. Your loving sister, Flory. Flory only discovered that Horace had been killed when she received the letter back, unopened, marked, killed in action. That's how she found out her 16-year-old brother was dead. Horace was just 16th when he, 16 when he died with the 15th Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment. He was killed along with 2,000 men of the 31st Division who were killed or wounded in the attack on July 1st. This is the Connacht Cemetery, and it's on the sector of the battlefield where many of the Irish soldiers fought. You can see right behind me the Ulster Tower, which is one of the more famous landmarks on the battlefield, which commemorates uh, the men of the 36th Ulster Division and others, uh, including uh, a number of Irish soldiers. The road that runs along here, it's a modern road that's paved today, but at the time uh, it was known by another name. It was known as the Bloody Road. And as I've mentioned previously, many of the soldiers who died in places like the Bloody Road have never been recovered. 
and they continue to be recovered from the battlefield, including three men who rest in this cemetery today. They were found in 2015. One of the three has been identified. We know the units of all three of these men, but we do not know the names of two of them. And they're here, uh, right in the corner of the cemetery. One is a soldier uh, from the Cambridgeshire Regiment, uh, whose name is unfortunately not known. Another is a soldier from the Royal Irish Rifles. And the third is Sergeant D.H. Blakely, uh, who was a member of the Royal Inniskinning Fusiliers, who died uh, in the initial attacks on July 1st of 1916. This is the Lonsdale Cemetery. It's the final resting place of over 1,500 British soldiers and at least one French soldier, which you can see right there with the, uh, the cross. There may be others, but that's the only one I saw. Uh, of the over 1,500 British soldiers buried here, over half are unknown, which is, uh, at least in my experience so far, fairly unusual. Uh, certainly not that many unknown in most of these cemeteries. Uh, this was the site of one of the major attacks that took place on July 1st. Behind me, you see a ridge, and then there's some trees there. Uh, and that is an area known as the Leipzig Redoubt, which was a major strong point for the Germans that was attacked on July 1st. And it was attacked uh, coming out of these woods behind me by two uh, PALS battalions out of Glasgow, Scotland. They were the 16th Highland Light Infantry, who were known as the Glasgow Boys Brigade, and then the 17th Highland Light Infantry, who were known as the Glasgow Commercials. Well, like many other units, they launched their attack, uh, and it's important to note that they didn't just start attacking at 7.30. Most of these units had moved into position overnight, and many of them had actually, using... Um, like trenches that were built toward the German lines and, and using defensive positions had crawled up into no man's land to get closer and then only jumped off, like stood up and started attacking right at 7.30. And that's what happened with these two units of Highland Light Infantry. One uh, second lieutenant uh, named Meadows actually described what happened. He was with the 17th. He said, at 7.25, we left the trench and we walked over to within 60 yards of the barrage. That was the creeping barrage that was leading them uh, toward the German lines. At 7.30, the barrage lifted and we rushed the front line defenses, destroying the garrison in and out of dugouts. I have few definite memories from the time we first saw the Germans to the time the machine guns swept us down outside the Leipzig redoubt. We waited for our own reserve waves and the Lonsdales, who should have come on behind, but no reserves reached us. We began to work toward the communication trench, but owing to the lie of the ground, we were badly exposed, and I at length found myself the only living occupant of that corner. They were unable, unfortunately, to hold it, and the Lonsdales did attempt to come to their aid, but they took heavy casualties as well. And this cemetery is named after the Lonsdales, even though many, many of the soldiers who are here uh, are from the Highland Light Infantry. And it's one of the, uh, the Highlanders' stories, one of those boys from Glasgow that I'd like to share with you here.
This is Sergeant James Turnbull of the Glasgow Commercials, the Highland Light Infantry. And you can see that it says VC after his name, which means he's a recipient of the Victoria Cross. He was a part of taking the Leipzig Redoubt. He was actually a 32-year-old former rugby player. So you can kind of picture in your mind what this man looked like. He helped capture a part of the Leipzig Redoubt which faced several strong German counterattacks later in the day. His official citation reads that he almost single-handed, he maintained his position and displayed the highest degree of valor and skill in performance of his duties. He was killed later on during the day. The largest American cemetery in all of Europe is the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery, which I visited a few days ago. It contains the graves of about 14,000 American service members who died here in France during the Great War. The cemetery that I'm standing in now, the Free Corps German Cemetery outside the town of Albert, is significantly smaller. I mean, way smaller. I, couple of acres. I mean, I, I would say it has to be a tenth the size of the American cemetery, if not smaller. But there are more Germans buried here than are Americans buried at the Meuse Argonne Cemetery. There are 17,000 Germans in this cemetery at Free Corps. Now, only, I don't know, a couple thousand have these markers, and each one of these markers has four names on it. Uh, so you can kind of do the math there. Uh, the majority, the vast majority, probably 10,000 or so, are in these three kind of communal graves, um, mass graves. And then there are these plaques, these huge plaques that just have thousands of names and dates on them. It's, it's really quite incredible. About 10,000 of the dead here are from the Battle of the Somme. Uh, 6,000 or so are from the Kaiserschlacht uh, offensive in the spring of 1918. And then the rest are from the early part of the war and then other parts of the war, including the Allied 100 Days Offensive that came toward the end of 1918. I've said this before and I'll say it again because it continually just really touches me. The way in which I see the Germans honored here uh, in these various cemeteries, uh, just looking at the main monument up at the, the head of the cemetery, and there are three wreaths full of poppies which have been laid by the Loch Nagar Crater Association, which is a British association. And one of them says, in honor of all the brave Germans who died on the Somme. Germans who died killing British soldiers. I love that a hundred years later, despite the differences, despite all that happened between these sides, that 
that sense of honor and, and decency can be afforded to men who were fighting for their country regardless of what that country was. This is one of the more unique military cemeteries among those in the Psalm. We're in the city of Albert, and we're actually in an extension of the city communal cemetery, the private cemetery for citizens. And French cemeteries are beautiful and very different than uh, what we're used to in the United States. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a look at that. But um, here we find the story of a captain of Australian pioneers. And his name was actually a German name. It was uh, Hermann Fritz Hubbe. I don't exactly know how to pronounce that name, but it's H-U-B-B-E. And he described uh, moving toward the front in late July, uh, watching an artillery barrage on a German position that they were preparing to attack. And he wrote these words. He said, flashes like summer lightning were quick and continuous. Make, making one flickering band of light, every now and then a low, lurid red flush, very angry, lit the horizon. All around the horizon, shells were flashing, and the pretty starlights made their graceful curves. He was killed in that battle to come, and he was buried here. He died on the 23rd of July, 1916. A German uh, who was defending in that same position wrote a letter that was discovered later. He actually wrote it the day that Captain Hubba was killed. And this is what he told his wife and children. He called it, In Hell's Trenches. My darlings, the gods only know if I am writing for the last time. We have now been two days in the front trenches. It is not a trench, but a little ditch. Shattered with shells, with not the slightest cover and no protection, we have already lost about 50 men in two days. We get nothing to eat or drink, and life is almost unendurable. To my last moment, I will think of you. There is really no possibility that we shall see each other again. Should I fall, then farewell. This is Flat Iron Copes Cemetery. It's the final resting place of 1,500 British Commonwealth uh, soldiers. And I should mention that phrase, uh, that, that word, that descriptive word, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, for our American audience and others who might not be familiar with it, there are a number of nations uh, that used to be part of what we called the British Empire. Um, but today it's known as the Commonwealth, and so that's the title that is used. Uh, all of these uh, cemeteries are operated by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, and so that's the title that we use. Uh, anyway, uh, like many of the cemeteries, uh, this particular cemetery is kind of out of the way. It's down kind of a back road and doesn't really seem to be connected to any of the major areas of combat, but that just goes to show you just how vast this battlefield was. Uh, because these cemeteries are just everywhere. They really are. There's five graves I want to take a look at in here, so let's go.
first grave I want to highlight here is that of Corporal uh, Edward Dwyer, who received the Victoria Cross for his actions in Ypres, uh, further to the north, before his unit, uh, the 1st Battalion of the East Surreys, was sent here to the Somme. Now, what's remarkable about Corporal Dwyer is that he is one of those rare people for whom we actually have an audio recording of him speaking uh, about the war before he was killed. Uh, and that exists to this day because after he received the Victoria Cross, he, he was sent back to Britain for a while to do speaking drives and drum up support for the war, things like that. Uh, very similar to what the United States did in World War II with people like John Bassalone uh, and the, the men who raised the uh, flag over Iwo Jima, people that had performed these great acts of heroism that became celebrities back home. And Eddie Dwyer was one of those people. There was only one thing you could cheer us up on the march, that was singing. We used to sing Tipperary choruses, invented by some of the chaps. Tipperary was in full swing then, and they'd always gone to something they'd invented themselves. It used to buck us up, and we would march all the better for it. Sometimes we'd sing some of T.H. Eliot's songs, you know, the chocolate colored coon. But we'd always go into something we'd invented. I don't think I've got much of a voice for singing, but I try and sing one or two of the choruses we used to sing. We're here because we're here, because we're here, because we're here, we're here because we're here, because we're here. Because we're here, we'd be far better off, far better off, far better off in a hug. Here we are, here we are, here we are again. Hello, 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 hello. Here we are, here we are, here As you walk through this cemetery, it's impossible not to notice these two stones. With the exception of two individual inscriptions, they're identical. They're both lieutenants. They're both last name Tregascus, different first initial. Same regiment, same date of death, one year difference on the age. Arthur and Leonard Tregascus were brothers. They were lieutenants in the same unit, the Welch Regiment, and they were a year apart. One was 32, one was 33, and they were killed within minutes of each other. One of them, I, I apologize off the top of my head, I don't remember which one, had been severely wounded, and the other came to his aid to see how he was, to check on his brother, to make sure he was okay, to treat him if necessary, and then he himself was shot and killed. The parents of the Tregascus brothers received notification about one of them in the morning. They got the notification for the other that night. About 30 feet from the Tregascus brothers are Thomas and Henry Hardwidge. They were in the same regiment. Four days after the Tregascus brothers were killed, uh, Thomas Hardwidge was wounded, and his brother Henry ran to his side to give him water, to give him aid, and both men were shot and killed. 
I wish I could say that these two sets of brothers were the only story like this, but sadly there were dozens of sets of brothers who fell here on the Psalm. It's just a, a product of the nature of these units where you have these PALS battalions in particular, these units that are raised from the same towns. Many brothers went to war together, and when you have situations where units are completely torn to pieces in a single day, it's inevitable that you're going to have uh, hundreds of stories of family members, brothers, cousins, friends, entire workplaces, entire neighborhoods that are just wiped out in an instant. But that's the song.